Hi, everybody. Dr. Pingel here. Um, we are going to be talking today about um, augmented and virtual reality. We've touched on a few of these concepts already uh, in things like uh, 3D printing, um, to some extent LiDAR, <clears throat> but uh, we'll, we'll focus on this uh, properly here uh, today. So um, virtual reality goes um, not way back, um, but I would say at least uh, 30 years digitally, um, well into the 90s, uh, a lot of stuff was being done. Uh, and before that, I think you could make a case uh, that uh, things like the Viewmaster uh, and sort of like 3D movies uh, and drawings uh, using these sort of classic red cyan anaglyph glasses um, were, you know, some ex to some extent ways to sort of create a 3D realistic impression uh, of an environment. But I think when we, when we usually think about VR, we're, we're thinking about uh, digital. Um, those have their origins in things like computer animation and gaming, which probably shouldn't surprise you. These are sort of um, uh, good ways to monetize this kind of technology that's been used uh, largely for entertainment um, as kind of a major driver, um, but, uh, but to some extent research and military applications as well. Um, some of the early years um, can be traced back to New York's Institute of Technology, uh, Computer Graphics Lab, uh, Lucasfilm and Pixar were uh, prime movers in this field in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and a big part of what was going on at that time was the development of software and hardware that could, that could handle these things. And I would say it's really only been recently um, that really good quality VR has been available um, on sort of the, the mass level, which, which in turn has driven um, a lot of the development. So there's this really interesting interplay between um, what's commercially available and how much money is in the system that can kind of go into the development um, and design of a lot of this stuff. So even though um, even stuff like Autodesk uh, and their interactions with and the development of computer aided design and 3D modeling um, were hugely important, it wasn't until these things sort of got good enough that the consumers started to buy in enough um, that it sort of uh, has caught fire um, just within the last couple of years um, with a couple of the um, really interesting technology. Things like uh, the Oculus Rift has been uh, a big player uh, in that space. Um, those kinds of things, um, when we think of virtual reality, one of the things we kind of classically think of is uh, head mounted displays um, or HMDs. Uh, the, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech and, and NASA were certainly big innovators in this field. Um, one of the, the early commercial units uh, came out in the early 90s. Uh, so Sega put out one of these. There's a, a competitor to that that has kind of since gone away. Um, but, uh, but Sega, I'm sure you've heard of, um, they had their, their VR1 unit that was designed for use in arcades. So these were very expensive, um, high, high performance kinds of things uh, for the early 90s. And so they certainly weren't available sort of commonly uh, in the environment, uh, but, uh, uh, but you, could go to, uh, you could go to arcades, especially in places like Japan, uh, where a lot of this cutting edge work was being done um, uh, to use some of this stuff. Uh, the, the technology for these HMDs uh, is fairly consistent. Um, so basically what you have here is miniature uh, LCD screens. Um, so it wasn't until LCD screens got good um, that a lot of the stuff was even possible. Um, these days, LCD screens are ubiquitous, but in the early 90s, they were not. Um, a lot of stuff was still on the consumer end. A lot of LCD screens were still not even color uh, at that point, um, although some of that stuff was, was available, um, but not as much as today. Um, and then uh, the packaging of, of small IMUs on chips. Um, so these are inertial measurement units. These are the things that sort of uh, measure the relative position uh, of an object. So everybody's cell phone has these now as you kind of tilt and move around that cell phone, it knows exactly its orientation in space. Um, uh, but in the early 90s, um, a lot of that technology sort of came out of the defense industry, um, but uh, became small enough and inexpensive enough that it could be integrated into other electronics. Um, for my part, uh, my first exposure to VR uh, really uh, was um, in uh, spatial cognition research. Um, this was some really interesting stuff going on in sort of the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, many of sort of the, 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 the kinds of tools that we have now, uh, like the Oculus Rift and others, um, pro prototypes and versions of that were available earlier on. Uh, they had much worse resolution. Uh, they had much worse um, 
head tracking and things like that. Um, but they but they did work um, again, maybe not well, um, but but OK. And so scientists were pretty quick to, to, to glom onto this uh, and start using it in research. And one of the really interesting fields that it was being used in uh, was environmental psychology uh, and um, environmental geography, where um, what we wanted to do was sort of understand how people interacted with their with their spaces uh, and to run these experiments in real physical spaces a takes time um, but but more importantly um, it was difficult it's difficult to manipulate your physical environment uh, if this building were here instead of there if it had this shape or that shape or if if there were these landmarks or not those landmarks the ability to sort of modify the environment um, in a really interesting way was very compelling to these researchers and so a lot of um, there were a number of researchers who adopted this kind of um, technology uh, for their research. Um, my first exposure um, uh, research-wise came here. Uh, it was on a, a wearable computing project that I worked on in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, the sort of successor to this is Google Glass, um, this technology that sort of uh, lets you see a computer screen on a, on a very tiny little, uh, basically prism um, uh, reflecting uh, a real screen. Um, <clears throat> their wearable computing actually encompasses a number of different technologies. Um, so it was kind of seen at the time as a lot of things sort of integrated into your clothing, um, gloves and jackets and things like that would have uh, computing technology. Um, much of the wearable computing movement um, would use really simple and, and strange IO devices, things that were kind of minimalist. Um, uh, many of them included head-mounted displays, um, but these days, kind of things that you would think of as wearable computing would be uh, certainly Google Glass, but ubiquitous stuff now, things like Apple Watches and Fitbits, um, things that you wear, um, but uh, but are sort of constantly gathering data and running computations and providing assistance for you uh, in maybe specialized ways as you as you go. Um, the the biggest technology I think um, to kind of drive this stuff forward was the was the advance of smartphones, which which happened very fast. Um, so, cell phones um, people were using cell phones in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, they started to get smaller. In the mid 1990s, um, there's sort of a companion piece of technology called personal digital assistants or PDAs. Um, things like the the Palm Pilot um, were uh, kind of classic in this field. Uh, but when those two technologies started to, to merge together, um, so Blackberries were kind of a, the first big example of this where um, enough computing power with enough capability was integrated into a single package. And then uh, iPhones and, um, you know, sort of the modern incarnation of the smartphone um, kind of took off from there. Um, what does this technology include? Um, you know, to some extent, this is ubiquitous in, in the lives of students these days, but uh, certainly, it can communicate over cell networks, uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Uh, we've got really, really good screens um, with touch screens. Uh, it's kind of easy to uh, forget how, uh, how how relatively recently this has come. Uh, uh, you know, I think I got my first real smartphone in the, I don't know 2010 or something like that. And uh, much worse by today's standards, I think that was a uh, droid, uh, if I remember correctly. Anyway, um, so uh, we've got powerful, powerful computing on these things. Um, you know, the, the, the chips that process the graphics uh, and video are great. Um, you know, you've got more computing power now than I think existed on the space shuttle or something like that. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of really interesting stuff. And, and paired with that are um, sensor packages that are great. So uh, everything has GPS in it these days. Uh, compasses, um, IMUs, cameras, microphones, and a variety of other sensors too. Uh, temperature, uh, magnetometer, proximity sensor, barometer, all of these things um, basically all packaged together um, commonly. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that, that once these things kind of break into the consumer market, they really do catch fire and they sort of start um, becoming sort of uh, in, you know, research projects uh, and getting out into the public and multiple companies start making them um, and uh, things really kind of take off rapidly from there. Uh, and so, you know, again, smartphones, uh, as we know them now, um, really only about 10 years old. Um, uh, 
a kind of companion technology to this uh, is the uh, sort of world-like rendering of, of uh, 3D content. Um, so a big breakthrough technology for this was Google Earth. Um, this was one of the first big packages to sort of put the, put the three-dimensional world at people's fingertips. Um, version one, uh, so this was a, a small company uh, really kind of spun up in about 2001. Uh, there's actually significant investment in this technology from the U.S. government and the intelligence industry uh, until it was um, kind of uh, bought up by Google uh, in 2004. We'll just go ahead and play this again. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the technology here, you know, again, this is practically ubiquitous in people's lives at this point, um, but it's um, essentially tiled imagery overlaid on a global DEM. And then later um, it started to include 3D building models. So by about 2010, 2012, um, lots of major urban areas were added. And then a big addition to this has been sort of the automated reconstruction of buildings and trees, um, which has really only happened within the last few years. So now within Google Earth, you're looking at not just sort of you know, major metropolitan areas, um, but, but areas of even kind of moderate sizes where, where um, entire buildings and uh, trees have been modeled. Uh, this is a section of the Virginia Tech campus um, and, you know, not photorealistic, um, but not too far off. Um, and, you know, I wish I had an animation of Google Earth from 2010 uh, to compare this with, but but far, far, far worse. Um, so now we've got millions, uh, probably billions of uh, separate models um, in these uh, all integrated in Google Earth. Um, Google Earth itself is integrated with things like SketchUp, which we talked about in the context of uh, CAD. And I should mention um, that other digital Earths do exist. Um, so NASA's WorldWind is kind of one big project. Um, the idea of a digital Earth kind of traces back uh, to the late 90s, I think. Um, Al Gore is credited with um, sort of defining a vision for this where uh, every school child could have access to sort of a, a complete model of the Earth at their fingertips. And it wasn't too long after that uh, when Google Earth was uh, was released. Um, so anyway, really exciting to have that kind of technology. Um, some early work on this uh, in the field of geography is virtual tube engine. Uh, so this is an example of that um, uh, scraped from uh, YouTube. Uh, essentially, we've got a, a, a really well, uh, you know, high resolution terrain model, uh, high resolution building models. Um, that are all photo layered. Um, so what you're seeing here is actually not um, three-dimensional models. Uh, well, they are three-dimensional models, but they don't have as much detail as you think they do. Um, they've been sort of overlaid with what's called a texturing process. Um, so uh, a relatively simple um, polygonal skeleton uh, is made of these buildings. Uh, and then over that sort of photographs uh, are composited and pasted um, to give them the sort of lifelike uh, quality. Um, around the same time, there's another technology that sort of gets big, which is Google Street View. Um, so this is um, a very ambitious project by Google to sort of drive cars around with ca uh, cameras mounted on the roofs. Um, they composited the photos from that to create um, sort of uh, a full 360 degree model. Uh, and then you can uh, obviously uh, you know, jump in at these points. It's now completely integrated with Google Earth. If you zoom in far enough, you, you find yourself in a street view. Um, and uh, these days, this technology has really kind of uh, gotten out in a number of different uh, forms. Uh, so uh, while you can take things, so you can create these uh, uh, image composites yourself. Uh, so with your smartphone, you can go out, you can take a variety of photographs and you can turn them into panoramas. Um, we also looked at how you can do some of this stuff with Microsoft um, Image Composite Editor. So now, you know, the technology to composite these photos is, is really right on your phone uh, or at least on your uh, or on your computer desktop. Uh, there are also uh, cameras uh, that sort of do this automatically in one shot. So this is an example, the Ryko uh, Theta. I can't remember which particular model this is, but we have one of these in my research lab, uh, two of these actually. Uh, and uh, they've got a camera on the front, as you can see, but they also have the exact same camera on the back. Uh, that camera is like a fisheye lens, so it captures things in uh, 180 degrees. Uh, and the software uh, automatically composites those into an image that you see here kind of at the lower left. Um, I love these images. Uh, if you've seen uh, sort of, uh, so, so this is uh, 
uh, a full 360 degrees on the on the x-axis and 180 degrees on the y-axis. Um, this is essentially like a Mercator, no, sorry, not a Mercator projection. This is like an unprojected WGS84 data set of the whole world is kind of what you're you're looking at, a complete sphere uh, of photos. So they call these things photospheres. Uh, the cameras that make them are spherical cameras. Uh, and the, uh, the kind of branch of photography that this is, is virtual uh, photography, uh, has gotten very uh, a, a powerful uh, movement within the um, uh, uh, house selling industry. Um, so these days, uh, realtors will, will take cameras like these into houses and take, um, take full 360 degree photographs of places. Um, uh, not too long ago, um, we started to get some of the first um, augmented reality uh, and mixed reality games. And I'm not going to try to distinguish those uh, at the moment here. Uh, but what we're talking about here is sort of a compositing of both um, sort of a, a digital world on top of the real world. And there are a couple of different ways of, uh, of doing this. Uh, the company that's behind a lot of this stuff is a company called Niantic. Um, they created the first one of these that I knew about was Ingress. I think that's usually credited as the first augmented reality game. There were some dedicated uh, devotees uh, of that game. Uh, I played a couple of those things, uh, sort of a, uh, groups of people who had to access portals and change them over. Uh, but it really it really got big with Pokemon Go, which I only played a little bit. Um, but that sort of caught fire uh, with the public. Um, and more recently, there's been a version of this. Uh, these are all sort of papered over versions of the same thing. So Pokemon Go is not that much different than Ingress. Uh, Harry Potter is not that much different than Pokemon Go. They're sort of taking one really good idea and, and uh, repackaging it for a different audience, uh, which is which is fine. Um, but uh, um, the idea is uh, objects are located, geolocated in the real world, and you have to interact with those sort of digital signatures in the, in in, uh, in real places uh, and go to those places with your phone, and then you can uh, kind of manipulate that. Uh, kind of one of the fun features here is that. Uh, the image from your camera, uh, they'll take that image and then they'll composite that with uh, digital content. Um, so you can actually see the little Pokemon uh, running around, uh, which is which is pretty cool. Um, one of my favorite projects for this is the uh, augmented reality sandbox. Um, so this is a real physical um, device. Um, it was uh, created by Oliver Kralos and Keck Caves at UC Davis. Um, the way this works is really fascinating. Um, so I've made one of these. I think they have one of these in the geosciences department uh, here at Virginia Tech. Uh, but you'll often find them around at sort of museums and demos and things like this. They're, they're getting to be a little bit common, mostly because Oliver Kralos has done a great job of sort of putting, putting this information out there of how to build them and uh, really engaging with the community to get these things um, created. Um, the way it works is you've got sort of a, a regular old sandbox, um, but suspended above it, um, you've got two uh, kind of uh, paired pieces. You've got a what's called the Microsoft Connect, um, which is a sensor originally obviously developed for the um, Xbox platform to uh, play games. Uh, but uh, in this case, it's, it's used to sense the position of the sand. Uh, and then a computer will redraw, um, uh, will sort of use that uh, essentially DEM. Uh, what's actually called a depth image um, to figure out the position of the sand to create a, a, a visualization that's sort of um, you know a hypsometric tint plus some contour lines uh, drawn over the top of it um, and then projected out with a paired projector so you see this connect and the projector kind of paired over the top at least hundreds of these probably thousands of these things have been built uh, you can buy them commercially i think they're selling for anywhere between five and ten thousand dollars um, the hardware itself to build one of these, you need a, um, a reasonably good projector. So that's, you know, five or six hundred dollars um, you need to connect. And then you need a, a computer with a relatively good graphics card to be able to keep up with the um, with the demands, especially the, the water surfaces that get modeled are fairly computationally heavy. The, the rest of it's not too bad, but uh, uh, but the water part definitely is. Um, so if you haven't seen one of these, I would encourage you to uh, to check one of these things out. They're a lot of fun. The augmented reality sandbox was kind of one really um, uh, good idea. Um, I have taken this and, and others as well um, to uh, inspire us to create things that are like that. Uh, so in this case, we've used a, we've created a 3D printed model of the of the world based on eTopo1 um, global elevation data. 
Uh, we printed that out on a number of different tiles. And then in this case, we've overlaid um, the um, NASA, um, or sorry, not NASA, this is the Earth Null School, um, basically weather imagery. You can put sea surface temperature on here. You can put all kinds of different weather patterns on here. Uh, another example of a digital Earth, uh, frankly. Um, but uh, um, this is kind of a fun one because you can really see sort of how the uh, interplay of terrain uh, and weather uh, works. You can sort of see big, big movements kind of going around uh, mountains in kind of interesting ways. Um, Oliver Kralos, the creator of the Augmented Reality Sandbox, has created a number of different sort of really awesome uh, virtual reality products. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is uh, his LiDAR viewer. Uh, he's using, he's demonstrating this with the HTC Vive, um, but, uh, and you're getting to see it sort of render around him, uh, which is also amazing. Um, So what he's got here is a, a terrestrial point cloud. Um, some of it's been colorized. You'll see him zoom in here on the colorized portion of it. And just using the um, using the, um, the the hand devices to, to manipulate and move, he can mark up um, different parts of the point cloud. He can measure things. He can create planar surfaces. Um, but it's a very naturalistic way of exploring um, this kind of uh, technology. Um, so he was using uh, uh, the HTC Vive for this, which is pictured kind of in the middle there. Um, we have one of those in my research lab. We also have a couple versions of the Oculus. Um, the Oculus uh, has been a, was one of the, the, the early um, competitors uh, in, in this field. Um, they released their first draft of this, I think, in ooh, I don't know, 2014, 2015, something in that ballpark. Um, and, uh, and I bought one of these, actually. Uh, for my research lab at the time, uh, and it was not amazing. Um, it was a neat experience. Um, there wasn't a lot of content released for it. Um, it was easy to kind of uh, exhaust uh, through the content that there was. Um, but kind of critically, the resolution of the of the screens and, and the, the latency. So this is how quickly the screen uh, will respond to uh, as you kind of move your head around and look around and tilt your head. How quickly uh, is are those adjustments made on the screen? One of the problems is, is, if, is if that uh, latency is uh, relatively high, uh, people get disoriented, they start to feel queasy uh, because what they're seeing with their eyes and what they're feeling with their bodies don't quite match up. So um, as, uh, as those issues have largely gotten resolved, um, there's still actually a, a fairly significant proportion of the population who finds these things. Um, they don't feel well when they're in these things for very long. Uh, and games that move pretty rapidly can start to feel bad. Um, uh, but, but you know, those, those problems are starting to go away uh, and uh, uh, they'll, they'll probably continue to, to get better as things go on. Uh, the cost for these things uh, now is uh, in, in the $400-ish price range, depending on, uh, you know, which exact model you get and uh, whether it's Black Thursday or Black Friday uh, or not. Um, I got a, um, I bought a personal uh, version of one of these um, because I, I liked the technology so much and I think I ended up only paying $300 for it. Um, the Oculus Quest has come out, uh, which is a wireless device. Um, so now there's an onboard computer, so you don't even need to be tethered to anything, which also sort of significantly improves the appearance. Um, uh, that one in, in particular is kind of fun because you can tether, tether it uh, using a USB cable and so you can access both kind of the limited set of titles uh, that are available uh, for the wireless version. Uh, the computer there, as you might expect, is not quite as powerful as it might need to be for some of the more advanced games. Um, so if you plug into a computer, you can access the computer's GPU uh, and, uh, and get sort of the, the full spectrum. So um, this stuff is really exciting. Uh, lots of consumer interest in this. Uh, Facebook kind of famously bought um, Oculus not too long ago. Uh, and they've been really um, funding a lot of the um, a lot of the development, um, marketing and packaging and creating games. 
uh, things are a bit on, uh, I, I would say that with virtual reality, things are a bit of a slippery slope. Um, I would say even though gaming is a huge industry, um, I still don't know all that many people uh, that are gaming in VR, um, which I find amazing because the experience is actually quite powerful. Uh, and they're not really all that expensive, but, uh, but for whatever reason, um, you know, 3D movies didn't exactly take off either. Uh, for whatever reason, um, virtual reality is still struggling. And so there's a, there's a still a bit of a, um, a question mark, I think, as far as what is, what's going to happen with this. I don't think it's ever going to go away entirely, um, but I think what we're seeing is maybe the world isn't quite ready uh, for this technology yet, or there are other reasons that they don't like it. Uh, uh, but, uh, but anyway, a couple of other um, technologies at sort of opposite ends of the spectrum uh, that I think are really interesting. Um, one is Google Cardboard, um, which is literally just like a $12 uh, foldable cardboard box uh, that holds your smartphone. Um, it has a couple of uh, lenses in it um, to sort of provide uh, the appearance that you need. Uh, and uh, uh, you can use these things and it basically use the IM, it uses the IMU that's in your phone to create a relatively good um, virtual reality experience. Um, there's uh, the, the big hitch is interaction. Um, so the interaction is mostly sort of um, uh, proprioceptive uh, and uh, uh, you know you, you can move your head around, you can look around, that part all looks real. Um, it basically has a, what, what ends up being sort of like a single button uh, that you can use uh, to interact with, with things. And so there's a limited ability to sort of select things on the screen as you go some gaze based interaction. Um, but for the price, uh, you know, all, you're, you're just sort of using the, um, uh, the device that you're, you were already using. Um, so, uh, so for, for the co cost of entry for this, it's, um, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, there are a couple of competitors for that. You can sort of buy versions of these that are made of plastic and whatnot. Um, but, uh, but they're all a pretty good time. Uh, and, and again, they work, um, better than you'd probably expect. Um, a couple of other things that are, um, uh, one of the other things that's really fascinating is the HoloLens. Um, I haven't had any direct experience with the HoloLens yet, uh, but there are a couple of these on campus at Virginia Tech. Um, uh, the idea here is, is Microsoft is sort of pitching this as a, as a mixed reality. Um, we're not trying to overlay um, anything directly onto the world, which is sometimes what uh, augmented reality is sort of categorized as, but, but we're sort of seeing an embedded, so in this case, you can sort of see an example here. It's a, like an embedded screen kind of off to the side as you're working in the real world. Um, you can imagine that that would be hugely valuable. In this case, they're sort of demonstrating uh, repairs uh, and, and getting a, a technician to sort of get um, uh, advice from uh, someone else as they're uh, repairing something. Um, and, and both people theoretically can sort of see exactly what's going on uh, as they're uh, as they're working. So pretty pretty interesting technologies uh, at sort of opposite ends of the um, expense spectrum. Uh, another favorite of mine uh, is Google Earth uh, virtual reality. Um, so you've seen Google Earth before. Um, this is essentially Google Earth, uh, all of the data that's behind it, um, but um, uh, but in a VR experience. Um, I was skeptical as far as what this would be like, um, but first of all, uh, the Google Earth catalog of what is in there is way better than it used to be. Um, the terrain is more uh, is better. The the, uh, air, the satellite photography is better. But the three D modeling is is a lot better. Um, and when this is integrated into into uh, so I worked with this on the Oculus Rift. Um, it really does feel very lifelike uh, and the experience of it, um, this was kind of one of the, the things that sort of drives home the difference between interacting with 3D content on a desktop environment and interacting with it in a virtual, real immersive virtual reality environment. Um, very different feelings, um, very different sensations as you're, as you're doing this. So um, I, you know, one of the things I regret is that, you know, we're not able to do this in person. Um, uh, but if you, there are lots of, of these kinds of units around, including at the library. Um, if you have a chance to try this out and sort of there's an open invitation uh, for you to stop by my research lab, if you want to try this out, I'd be happy to demonstrate it for you. Um, it's really quite uh, amazing. Um, <clears throat> virtual reality is getting embedded in a lot of different kinds of contexts. Um, so um, Cloud Compare, which we've used for some of our LiDAR data, um, uh, has uh, an integration with uh, the Oculus Rift. 
So it's as simple as sort of um, going to one of the, uh, there's a, a button here. Let's get my marker out. There's a button right there um, that's basically turned this into 3D. Uh, and they, they use the sort of red and um, cyan uh, dots to indicate the 3D goggles. Um, and uh, if you press that button and if you've got an Oculus, you can uh, basically jump into your point cloud in three dimensions. Um, the user interface is not great. Um, it uh, it works. You can you can move. You can do some stuff. Not as polished as as kind of maybe what you might be used to, sort of more polished virtual reality applications. Um, but uh, uh, but still quite cool and uh, really fun to see it as uh, easily integrated um, as it is. Uh, so it's 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 the the very low bar to sort of um, immersively experience your point cloud. Um, I'll also mention uh, that there are other technologies supported by this. Um, so uh, uh, in kind of a fun way, uh, you can actually, uh, if you have a pair of the, the old 3D cardboard red and cyan and glyph glasses, uh, you can just look at it that way. Uh, so I always keep a, a couple pairs of these laying around because it's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, if you want to kind of move up in the sophistication, you can use things like NVIDIA's 3D vision glasses, um, to, uh, which are sort of an active, it's an active shutter. They actually... Uh, provide um, it's synced up with your monitor uh, and the glasses and sort of your, you sort of look at one eye and look with the other eye and look with the one eye it happens you know a really high rate of speed 120 megahertz uh, 120 hertz or something like that um, uh, so you don't even notice uh, but it's a uh, you know that's a much more realistic um, 3d experience now, higher price tag uh, so I guess I would probably recommend the oculus but uh, but they still work okay um, so, so far we've been talking a lot about VR, uh, that sort of, um, uh, per person, right? So you, you put on the, the, the glasses, you put on the HMD, uh, and you kind of jump into this virtual space, but there are examples of virtual reality, um, in kind of larger places. Um, there are many, so the, the kind of movement to do this, uh, to create a larger, um, virtual reality space is called, uh, caves. So it's, a an interestingly recursive, uh, uh, name so cave stands for cave automatic virtual environment they've done that on purpose to be funny um, the idea here is you sort of generate a room you put uh, or you you create a, a, a real space usually a partial cube um, you'll have uh, projectors uh, behind each one of these things uh, oftentimes uh, there will be some glasses that kind of help um, make this appear a little bit more real so if you're looking at that image in the upper left um, it looks a little bit fuzzy, and that's because there's sort of a, a passive, um, uh, basically sort of like the red and cyan glass experience, um, uh, but without the colors, uh, so you can sort of see things in their, their real richness. Um, and uh, and, and it, you know, these things are really nice, mostly because you can get more than one person in there. These places can be much more uh, collaborative. Movement is a little bit easier. Um, uh, again, Virginia Tech has a couple of these, so there's the Visionarium. Uh, which is uh, basically like a, a cave environment. And then there's the, the cube, um, which is a much bigger four story uh, environment. Um, if you have a chance to do one of these tours, um, they're really um, quite spectacular. Um, virtual reality is taking off in a lot of other domains than geography, uh, for sure. Um, a couple of my favorite applications of these, uh, one is uh, archeology. span So archeologists are interested in sort of recreating what things were like in the past and virtual reality is a good way to do that. Uh, it can really uh, help people experience things in a more uh, realistic way. Um, and then another favorite of mine is sort of um, the ability to kind of uh, shrink yourself down and see things uh, at the microscopic level that are impossible to see. Um, so uh, this is an example of um, uh, one, uh, a professor creating a, the ability for his, uh, I think it's a molecular, um, mo molecular biology class uh, to kind of jump inside uh, and see the, the shapes and expressions of these molecules um, and how they interact in a way that's difficult to do uh, again in a, in a desktop environment. It's not that you can't create these 3D models. In fact, the, the 3D modeling part is the same, uh, generally speaking, between um, sort of desktop 3D and VR. Uh, but the but the virtual reality experience is really quite powerful um, and um, and can. Um, better in part uh, what some of these things are like um, than, uh, than just the desktop. 
Um, behind the scenes, uh, there are a couple of sort of technologies that make this stuff happen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the, the open technologies um, first. So uh, the first big push to get uh, virtual reality out uh, to the public again happened in the 90s. Um, this was a technology, this was a language called VRML, the Virtual Reality Markup Language. Um, Text-based thing that actually looks a lot like a, like a JSON file. Uh, if you've seen some GeoJSONs, the structure uh, of these uh, of this language looks a lot like that. Um, it had ways to sort of declare geographic uh, primitives, so planes and circles and um, cubes and things like that. Um, you could sort of paper over them with images, um, so you could texture things in, in relatively easy ways. Um, the 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 best part of this technology was that it was uh, intended to deliver VR over the web. Um, so the World Wide Web was just getting to be pretty popular. Um, that had sort of taken off and, and this was seen as a way to deliver 3D content to everybody um, irrespective of their platform, right? So uh, whether you're using a Mac or, or a PC, uh, all of this stuff would render the same. And in fact, there's, there's been a bit of a tension between, um, you know, deploying things like this as an app, so things like Google Earth, um, versus um, deploying things via the web. Um, and uh, most of the time lately, I would say apps tend to be winning. Uh, it's a bit of a puzzle uh, because, um, you know, theoretically, uh, you know, again, this is how people made it in the 90s. The appearance of this isn't spectacular, but, um, uh, you know, theoretically, the web offers um, very good capabilities for interaction and, and, and whatnot as well. Um, so uh, it is a little bit too bad that, that web-based systems have been doing as poorly uh, as they have, but but there, there are good reasons for that. Um, the, uh, the, the modern version of VRML is a language called X3D. Uh, it's basically, they, they took the old VRML and they made it XML uh, and kept kind of developing the language. Um, still sort of based on similar kinds of concepts, primitives, planes, and, um, uh, and spheres, and triangles, and uh, it does get a little bit more complex from there, but, but not a lot. Um, so, um, so I think XM, X3D sort of had a lot of uh, potential and, and has not really taken off um, as much as kind of people thought it, thought it would. Um, X3D, actually, Virginia Tech has a really strong connection to the X3D spec. Um, so Peter Sforza is um, from CGIT, is really active in this space. Um, and uh, the geospatial component that is a part of the X3D spec um, was integrated very, very, very early on. Uh, and so as a result, um, geospatial uh, is, uh, is, is really well supported uh, in, this, uh, in this computing environment. The modern form, I guess, of, of kind of how VR is working on the web uh, is uh, a new specification called WebXR. Um, it's being kind of um, created out of whole cloth, I guess. Uh, it, it, it's not really kind of coming out of the VRML X3D world, um, although it shares some of the same ideas. Um, they've, uh, what used to be called WebVR and WebAR is now called WebXR. Um, which sort of um, really speaks to the fact that the people are not seeing these things as entirely separate anymore. It really is a continuum. Most of the pieces that support one of these support the other. So rather than developing something for augmented reality and something for virtual reality, let's just develop something that kind of supports them both, which, which totally makes sense. Um, Firefox is probably the leading browser that supports the specification right now. Uh, Chrome does an okay job. Um, Google has been kind of making noises that they want to try to lead the lead in this space. Uh, and so there's been a bit of something like a browser war going on. Um, but, uh, um, but my expectation is, is that probably WebXR is, is likely to win out here. Um, and we'll, we will see an open VR spec uh, for the web. Um, all right. Um, one of my uh, favorite uh, examples of this is uh, the A-Frame package. Uh, so A-Frame really makes it simple to create. Uh, it kind of, it's, it's essentially doing what uh, X3D was supposed to do. Uh, there's a lot of support to create some, some really simple primitives um, so that it's easy to start building a virtual world with, with very little 
coding. Um, and the beauty of this is that it works, um, in my opinion, that the, the thing that this does that X3D never quite did um, was um, support user interfaces. Um, so while X3D was a, was a fine language, it never quite had a way to interact with the hardware uh, that we want to interact with. So it never quite got off of the sort of flat screen. Um, there's no reason why it couldn't. Uh, you know, the, the commonality here between CAD and virtual reality and animation and 3D movies, all of this is sort of built on the same stuff. Um, but what, what A-Frame uh, and the X, WebXR community have done is, is made it easier to, to sort of get online and get working with this stuff um, with your Oculus or with your um, uh, even Google Cardboard or whatever. Um, to, it's supporting the hardware in a way through, through web pages that has not been done. Um, there are a couple of, uh, so if you just Google A-Frame, uh, you'll land on this page. Um, so it's just aframe.io. Um, lots of good little examples of this, and I'll, uh, I'm, I'm not going to show you a lot of them, um, but mostly these examples are here not to impress you with what they can do themselves, but how you could use these as building blocks um, for larger scale projects. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to show you how easy it is to build something like a 3D photosphere uh, and deploy it. Um, so if you if you wanted to sort of take a picture of this stuff with your uh, with your camera and deploy this stuff up on the web, how could you do it? Uh, there are a number of different websites um, that support looking at 3D um, uh, films. And in fact, um, you can put um, 3D videos uh, up on uh, uh, YouTube uh, and, and watch VR movies uh, uh, straight from YouTube. Uh, but uh, but I wanted to show you how you can kind of do it on your own, building kind of your own thing, uh, rather than going through a, a separate service. So this is just a 3D photosphere. If you're in here, you can put on your uh, you can put on your Oculus. Uh, you can do it on your desktop. You hit the VR button uh, and you're inside. Uh, <clears throat> and all it takes to um, deploy that is, is just these simple lines of code. Um, so uh, there is a um, uh, essentially just a, um, a little um, one line thing uh, that creates a photosphere uh, and you can kind of manipulate that as you go. Um, really, really um, easy to implement this stuff. Uh, another really exciting one is A-Terrain. Um, so A-Terrain basically provides something like uh, Google Earth functionality without the 3D buildings, um, but it does have um, an easy way to integrate um, layered terrain directly in your uh, environment. Um, really, uh, really powerful. Uh, it it kind of goes through this um, spin-up company called Cesium. Um, Cesium, I think we talked about a little bit in the context of uh, LiDAR. Uh, but um, but really easy again to just sort of um, if, if if what you want to do is sort of put uh, a mountain uh, in here uh, so I'll put an example uh, this is an example of um, looking at uh, if you wanted to look at Mount Whitney um, you just really have to go to this web page and put in the latitude and longitude and elevation you want to be at and uh, instantly you're there and you can look around um, that's really amazing right not because Google Earth doesn't already do it, but because we've got a way to integrate this into other applications. And that's kind of the, the log jam with something like uh, Google Earth is. It's great on its own, um, but, but sort of building off of that platform, making it do something else uh, can be pretty difficult. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to mention uh, one other little technology that I'm really excited about. Uh, this is an A-frame poetry combination. Um, so uh, we're kind of actively building on, on this platform in our lab. Uh, this lets you basically take point clouds uh, and incorporate them into your world. So now essentially if you, if you can kind of see all the pieces that are available, we can bring in point clouds, um, we can bring in terrains through A-frame um, or A-terrain. Uh, we've got uh, uh, A-frame uh, and the web XR spec make it easy to sort of have interaction with um, you know an Oculus Rift uh, or a HTC Vive or whatever. All of these pieces are here, and, and, and now the challenge is sort of assembling these pieces into new and exciting products. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're doing in my research lab. Uh, and then this is just an example. I won't play it, but I put the URL up here. Um, this is a interior scan, uh, terrestrial lidar, uh, terrestrial lidar scan uh, of a space. 
Um, so here we're using a relatively dense point cloud. Uh, you can basically jump into the space and start looking around. Uh, again, hitting, hitting that button in the lower right hand corner uh, to, to jump in here. So some really exciting stuff. Um, I it was excited to present some of this stuff to you. If you have questions about it, um, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, until then, uh, thanks, and uh, we'll see you next time.